<laughs> we call that a little audience warm up. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Are you dry and warm and happy and yes. right? Uh, anything going on in Washington, D.C. today? You following the news? Are you all news hounds? Okay, good. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I'm Frank Sesno. I'm the director of the School of Media and Public Affairs. <laughs> and you're clapping for the School of Media and Public Affairs and not for the Frank Sesno part of that, but I'm really, really, really delighted to be here, looking forward to this conversation and looking forward to your participation in the conversation. We have a lot to discuss. Our guest this evening will be introduced in just a moment. Uh, I do want to thank you for coming here. And I do want to say how important it is to all of us that we stand at this university for the kind of discussion, sometimes tough questions, exploring the issues up front and personal front row to history. And that's what we will do here this evening with someone who watches it on a daily basis. How many have seen, uh, in the room have seen uh, Meet the Press? OK, let the record show that's everybody. Uh, this is a good thing. Uh, I want to thank a few people for being here. Uh, first and foremost, I want to thank um, our National Council. The School of Media and Public Affairs National Council is a group of volunteers, ambassadors, representatives, advisors. They are amazing. And through their generosity and the generosity of many others like them, they help us have events like this. Their philanthropy and others' philanthropy allows us to bring to you the kinds of programs and opportunities and events that make uh, the George Washington University unique. Um, I want to thank as well uh, people from the Columbian College of Arts and Sciences. Uh, Dean Arneson and where's Jean Chaco? Is she here? Oh, right next to Dean Arneson. So uh, how many Columbian, how many CCAS majors do we have in the room? All right, a big round of applause for Columbian College. <laughs> SMPA is within the Columbian College and we are very proud of our liberal arts uh, roots and traditions. For those of you who don't, do not know, SMPA is half of our undergraduate majors are journalism, mass communication. The other half are political communication. I like to refer to that as the two sides of the seesaw, one side that tries to make the news, the other try, the side that tries to report the news. So it's an interesting seesaw. I'm very much looking forward to this evening's conversation because as many of you may know, my background really was many years at CNN. For seven years at CNN, I hosted a Sunday talk show. Uh, I experienced the pressures, the contradictions, the compromises, and the challenges of doing a program like that, where you are both trying to summarize a week, put an eyeball on the week ahead, and provide not just a headline, but also some nuance and some context. But <laughs> what I did, I did before the hyperactivity and the constancy of digital media, and before the challenges, shall we say, of the Trump era in which we now live, where everything is so polarized. So I think tonight's conversation will be remarkable. I would now like to introduce the 17th president of the George Washington University, whose many emphases are focused on making this experience better for everybody. But one of his key priorities is the student experience. And so how many students in the room? All right, most of you. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome President Thomas LeBlanc. Thank you, Frank, and thank you to the School of Media and Public Affairs for hosting this event tonight. I'd like to welcome all of you to Betts Theater, and I understand we have a group live on Facebook. Welcome as well. Uh, it's great to have you here tonight. GW started offering journalism courses over 80 years ago. That was like the first generation of the iPhone. <laughs> and it was the first university in the United States to offer a degree in political communication. Imagine what our world would be like without those degrees today. And now in these unprecedented times, the school is focusing a spotlight on freedom of speech, freedom of the press, and civil discourse. And these topics are incredibly important to our democracy right now. So I'm delighted to be with you tonight for a conversation featuring a former GW student, someone who lived in Thurston, just like you. <laughs> someone who was here in the Bad Theater, just like you. Someone who slept through some courses, I'm sure, just like you. Uh, meet the press moderator, Chuck Todd. Chuck is also a member of the GW's National Council for Media and Public Affairs, and 
And uh, Frank Sesno told you a little bit about that just a moment ago. It's a very important council. It's an advisory body for the school. And I also would like to welcome and thank the members uh, in attendance for being a part of that effort. As the NBC political director and the host of the most watched Sunday morning pu public affairs show, Chuck Todd is no stranger to the friction between politicians and the journalists who cover them. It's my pleasure now to welcome our own Chuck Todd back to GW for this conversation on the future of our press and our democracy. Please give a welcome to Chuck Todd. <laughs> well, um, as we said, not much going on today. Yeah. I, I was a little worried that we might not see you tonight, that you might have a rendezvous with some other destiny. I, I, I thought maybe a little bit, but Brett Kavanaugh didn't pick me to interview him tonight. <laughs> yeah, what was Why that? Why am I not surprised? What, what, what I'm still that? trying to absorb that. I've been reading the, uh, reading the clips as they've been coming through before coming on here. Now, by the way, the last time I was in this theater, I think I was playing my French horn. Because every other GW event I've done since, since leaving GW has always been in the wonderful space we have over here. This is, this is a big deal to be in Bet's Theater. Well, and, and, and so you're on the French. Thank you. Is that your French horn and the theme for Meet the Press? Uh, <laughs> it's a good idea. Yeah. You should aspire to that. Yeah, it's, that's good. I'm not going to ruin John Williams' music that way. It's, it's uh, pretty amazing. I can't do that. So how about a quick little survey? How many uh, people here watch Meet the Press with you know, I regularly? That. Look at okay. that. How many people watch Sunday television when it's live on Sunday television? Yeah, right now. How many watch it online? Okay. How many watch Chuck's show on MSNBC? Okay. Okay. So a lot of people engaged here. Uh, who knows who Brett Kavanaugh is? <laughs> okay. So <laughs> About Rod Rosenstein? Yeah, that's got a pretty high name ID. So today was just an extraordinary day. When what we'll do here tonight... It's an it, extraordinary moment happening right now in television. A Supreme Court nominee is sitting down for a television interview. Where? Uh, on Fox. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, but not with one of the journalists, with one of the uh, opinion show people, Martha McCallum, who actually I find very, she's usually very thoughtful, I think, in her questions, and, and, and it doesn't look like it was a very penetrating interview, wasn't, wasn't trying wasn't. to, but, but it seemed to be the bait, it went to get at the basics. How many people in the room saw of the, the relationship clip of the, of the Kavanaugh this evening? Not many. So he, w he defended himself staunchly. Said with he his was, wife. It was with his wife, his wife next to him. W said he was not going to withdraw from this thing and got quite emotional, actually. I, as you might expect. I mean, you know, one of the things that I always try to remind people in our business is, you know, we all are human beings. You know, one of the things I always say, we're all born with original bias. You know, just check your pulse. If you're a human being, you have original bias where you're born, um, you know, it automatically is going, is going to shape who you are. Right? Where you're born, who you're born to, all of those things going to shape who you are. So in that sense, we're all born with a little bit. So yes, he's a human being. He's going to have the, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm still angry at my sixth grade teacher, Mrs. Hicks, who accused me of cheating on a test. <laughs> and it cost me, and my staff has heard me say this, talk about this twice now in the last week. You know, when you're, and this is where, because I've, long story short, I would have loved to have had the FBI around, please, FBI, investigate. I did not cheat on this test. It cost me. You could go on Fox and explain. It cost me that. the lieutenant. I was, I was the, the lieutenant on the safety patrol, and I got kicked off of it. <laughs> and I'm still chapped about it, you know? Um, I loved Mrs. Six. If she's still around, I didn't cheat on that test, and neither did Drew. Um, <laughs> but uh, so. Yes, you're going to jump, you, I, I, you know, it would have been, it would bother me if he wasn't emotional. It would bother me if it, you know, so, and I, you know, it's just watching it. If he wasn't, um, if this wasn't breaking him down a little bit. But I have to tell you, I, you know, the thing that I've been wondering is how, how does he stay impartial? At the end of the what day. Do you, what do you mean? Well, at the end of the day, we want our Supreme Court justices to, to give us the illusion that they are capable of being impartial when it counts. You know, we get you that these are political that appointees, okay? These are presidential appointments, so they're inherently political. But what we're looking for is that person who, while they have come up in some ways, and there's, and I got, 
By the way, I have no issue with having politicians on the Supreme Court, people with political backgrounds on the court. I think there should be, not everybody should have a political background on the court, but I, I think somebody on that court of those nine people need to understand how these rulings will impact um, the politics of, of, of uh, you know, how the politics will play out in something and how, how it'll impact people in, a, in the real world, not just in a theoretical um, constitutional law classroom. So, um, but I think this sort of crosses, it's the first time I can, it, there's no other Supreme Court nominee. Oh, he's has, campaigning for the right, job. That's right, you're campaigning for the job. Um, so how do, how and do, if he had done all the networks tonight, I would judge this interview a little bit differently. How? But well, by well, do, I mean, what difference does it make whether he does one or he does five? Because I mean, he's, the, not doing, he's not doing any interview. He's really just, this was Bill Shine, who Martha McCollum's former boss, is the communications director of the White House. So the person who hired Martha McCollum to do the job is the one who's handed the interview of a lifetime, okay? A Supreme Court, any Supreme Court justice or Supreme Court nominee, that's, that's something that's a unique thing. So, so it, you know, in that sense, it's not, it, it's, it's not gonna have the same level of credibility. If, if you're Judge Kavanaugh, and if you're giving this suggestion, if I were him, I'd say, that's great. I also wanna do, give me two other networks to do so that it doesn't look like I'm just campaign, you know, that it doesn't look like what it looks like. But what in the end, it's all going to come down to three, four, five, maybe Republicans, and that, that may, where the dam may break or may not. Here's what we're going to do tonight. We're going to talk a little bit about our immediate moment, Kavanaugh, Rosenstein, a few other things, implications for the, for the midterms. Chuck wrote a very um, thoughtful and in some ways provocative piece in The Atlantic called The Press Fights Back and how he believes that... You didn't write the headline, for what it's worth, but... You wrote... <laughs> every, every writer always says that. Yeah, my headline. In any case, he wrote the article that's, <laughs> that you can find beneath the headline, The Press Fights Back. Uh, and so we should talk about that, mm -hmm. where the press is going, and then um, Meet the Press. Meet the Press is the longest-running public affairs program of its kind on television, 70 years. Uh, what role does it play? And we have Scott Nover here who wrote a piece for The Atlantic about the, the, the Sunday talk shows. And then we want to open it up to, to your questions and wherever they may go. So let's start then with the headlines, okay? Mm -hmm. We'll come back to Kevin Armin. Rosenstein, yeah. big story today. Rosenstein, the guy to whom Bob Mueller, special counsel here, reports. Right. Summoned to the White House, maybe he's fired, maybe he's going to re re resign. What are the implications for this investigation and this incredible moment in our history on this guy's shoulders right now? I actually don't think it's going to be as dramatic as it could have been under a different circumstance. Look, I think, I think he committed a fireball offense. What he said. What Rod Rosenstein did and said. I think, he, I think at the end of the day... I'm going to wear a wire. That's right. And there is some level of insubordination. Some level of insubordination. Yeah, okay. Um, I, look, I, I, in some ways, if the president doesn't fire him, then he is, you could say he's almost tacitly giving a permission slip for, that he's just admitting, I got no control over my government. Um, and maybe he wants the deep state, right? Maybe he wants it. There is an excuse. I don't mean to be that crass about it, but there, you know, so I think it's... I, and I think it would be healthier for the investigation if, if this would take place. And, and here's what I mean. It seems like everybody caught the same disease Jim Comey caught, okay? James Comey, it, it, I actually could go back to the Republican convention in, in 2016, and the, one of the more remarkable lines in, in President and then candidate Trump's acceptance speech was, I alone can fix it. And then, if you think about that, we've had, that, that was basically the James Comey mindset. I alone am going to fix this. I'll I know we have this credibility crisis and what the press is doing to, what, what Fox is doing to the credibility of the FBI and the email investigation. I'll take care of this. I alone can do this. Um, Rod Rosenstein, I alone can do this. You know, I can go back to this Harry Reid and Mitch McConnell. We're only here because of this, of, 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 we're only here with the Supreme Court mess because Harry Reid and Mitch McConnell um, decided to change the rules of the Senate um, because they alone could fix this judicial problem and this judicial process. Anyway, you, you see my point. Anytime people, it's funny, and people in Washington, this is when they find the trouble, right? When they, they think they can do this on their own, they can go around the system, they can work the system, they can, you know, they could, they could you, it, you don't work through the system, you, you end up 
getting into more trouble. Chuck, what? So I guess I would say this with Rosenstein. I think this is going to be, I think he should have offered his resignation. So if those reports are true, although I do think that Justice and the White House were trying to race to leak in order to shape the story. You know, oh, he's coming over here to, be, to offer his resignation. What do you mean? He's going over there to be fired. Um, you know, I think it, it's in everybody's interest. Obviously, the White House. They, they know how to manage the cable universe. Well, they're trying to manage the cable. They, they certainly made cable stop all day. I noticed that off yes. and on. I had, had a couple of doctor's appointments. Mondays are my, Monday's my weekend. So today's the day I, you know, go to the doctor's office. I got a back thing. I had to go get an MRI <laughs> thing. I mean, you know, whatever. I got to run errands, right? Like everybody else. Um, so, but I was dipping in and out of cable, and you're right, it was a manipulation of cable today that was like, ugh, I'm so glad I didn't have to do it, you know, just so glad a, I had a day off. Right, just it. with the Supreme Court justice yeah. on deck, right, this comes along it, and it provides just, a complete day of distraction from, from the next great thing. I'm not going right. to make suggestions no, here, and, and, but here's the question, Chuck, the question is... And cable's never been able to figure out how to do two stories at once. It just is impossible. Well, it's called split screen. It can do two stories. It can't do... Uh, if Rosenstein resigns yeah. or is fired, if he is not there, the concern among many, I understand. and it's one of the reasons that the Freedom Caucus and others have been mm -hmm. trying to push him out, but mm -hmm. the concern among many is that Mueller, his independence or his investigation itself is endangered. Do you see it that way? I, I just don't. I think there is enough of us watching it. I think there's enough media watchdogs now. I think there's enough Senate watchdogs at this point. I think there's enough people in the Justice Department. I think there's Kellyanne Conway's husband. Um, on Twitter, <laughs> I, 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 I'm, by the way, I'm, I'm, I'm serious about that. I think that the, all of the different sort of public ombudsman things that have been going on, whether it's from elected people or former Justice Department people, um, that, is, that does help. So I actually don't, I think that Mueller's probe would have been in bigger trouble had Rosenstein been gone six months ago than today. I think, I think there's too much, he's had too much success. My Who's God, Mueller's Mueller. Yes, he's it's got one of the, it's these, he's, got he's gotten convictions, guilty pleas. guilty pleas. This is much more successful than Starr, much more successful than some of these other um, uh, special counsels. So I think it's too well established. So in some, you know, this is why I think Trump may actually want to keep him around because he wants him as a punching bag. He wants to bring it back. He wants to show that it's, I actually think it helps the legitimacy of the investigation if Rosenstein goes. It helps the legitimacy of the of investigation the, if, Rosenstein if Rosenstein goes, goes because it takes that because away. Because it takes that away. You want to take that but little Rosen, virus but, but, but out, the, excise that. And I'm sorry, he act, th this is the problem. And whatever it is, Andy McCabe, it's possible he leaked all this because he's trying, you know, they're criminally trying to prosecute him. Right. Um, which is, I think, one of the most, I think what has happened to Andy McCabe is is, is among the worst character assassinations we've seen, maybe in the history of this country. Really? I think what has happened to him, I think that, maybe I'll be wrong, and we'll see what you the- You all know who Andy McCabe but is. But Andy McCabe, I, what the president did to him and his wife and the-, and the FBI. And, and at the FBI, and, and just implied that he was using his power at the FBI to manipulate, you know, somehow that Hillary Clinton and Terry McAuliffe bought him off. I mean, it, it is- it has ruined his life, ruined his professional life. He's not going to be able to get a real job. I think he's somebody that Pension. I'll be curious. He's got a civil suit that I would be, you know, I think we are going to have some definitional, I'll be very curious, for instance, if the, the gentleman that the uh, conservative um, think tank had, uh, Ed Whalen, outed yeah. as the potential other doppelganger to Brett Kavanaugh. I hope that person sues because I think we need to establish what the rules are. I say this, I'm not a big fan of lawsuits, but we gotta establish what are, good, what are, the, what are, the, what are the social, what are the rules going to be? What's prosecutable, what isn't? What are gonna be the standards on this? Because we have to figure it out. Because there is, it is, to, to go after bureaucrats in the government is something that, that, that's, that is, that brings back echoes of the 50s. You, you've now said we have to figure it out. We have to know where this investigation is going. I mean, this is all about trying to determine the truth, yeah. which is what we in journalism try to do. But a quick question to the audience. Anybody know who coined the term recently, alternative facts? No, I think people do know. Who? Uh, anybody know where they did that? I mean, they should know. 
on Meet the Press. We have a clip of that. You just... uh, and I, I, and we want to, I want to discuss it because it actually opens the door to a lot of the challenges and a lot of the issues that we've got right now. But just to refresh everybody's memory, it was right after the, inaugura the inaugural. Mm -hmm. It was right after the then White House press secretary, who was the first White House press secretary? Sean Spicer. Said what? Said what? Largest inaugural crowd. By the way, our best trivia question last week, how many communications directors was, was there at the White House between Cleveland Browns victories? <laughs> the answer was six. <laughs> so there were six White House communications directors between December of 16 and last week when the Cleveland Browns finally won a game. Let's take, let's take a look at this clip from Meet the Press. I want to have a great open relationship with our press, but look what happened the day before, talking about falsehoods. We allowed the press spray to come, the press to come into the Oval Office and witness President Trump signing executive orders. And uh, of course, you know, the Senate had just confirmed General Mattis and General Kelly to their two posts, and we allow the press in, and what happens almost immediately? A falsehood is told about removing the bust of Martin Luther King Jr. from right. the Oval Office. That, no, that's just flat out false. And the and pool writer- And it was corrected writer, immediately. But why, Chuck, but, why but was it said? No, Chuck, me, why was it said in the first place? Because everybody is so presumptively Klein, negative. Klein the head of that no, reporter. that it's okay. No, but excuse Ms. me. Oh, no, 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 no. That reporter was writing to the, uh, on behalf of the press pool, that that I falsehood that. got spread three thousand times but it does before not it was excuse, corrected. Excuse and me, it's it still does out not there. excuse, and you did not answer the question. I did you, answer no, your you question. No, you did not. You did yes, not answer did. the question of why the president asked the White House press secretary to come out in front of the podium for the first time and utter a falsehood. Why did he do that? It undermines the credibility of the entire. White House press office no, it on doesn't. day don't one. Be so, don't be so overly dramatic about it, Chuck. What it, it, you're saying it's a falsehood, and they're giving Sean Spicer, our press secretary, gave alternative facts to that. But the point remains Wait a alternative that facts? There's... Alternative facts, four of the five facts he uttered. The hey, one Chuck, thing he why, got hey, right Chuck... was Zeke Miller. Four of the five facts he uttered were just not true. Look, alternative facts are not facts, they're falsehoods. So always, we'll, we'll take, I, we'll no, take no. A, deep, a, deep, a deeper dive on this, but I want to know, and I've I always given her credit. I knew, I, at least she gulped before she said it. <laughs> she, knew, she knew it was bad. So what, how are you processing this as this is being hurled at you from the White House lawn? Kellyanne Conway is very good. No, it's a filibuster interview always, and it's the last time I agreed to a satellite interview with her. I don't think it's, I think it's a waste of time. CNN almost insists on doing satellite interviews with her because it creates the tension. A satellite interview creates more tension because there's no human being, you're staring at a lens, and... She was on the White House lawn, you were and, and, and you can't use, I can't use nonverbal cues to interrupt. So it automatically can, you know, re-escalate tensions fast. Um, to the point, like, you know, I, I wasn't losing my cool other than, uh, and, and then all of a sudden, alternative facts, and you're just like, you just, you're like, oh my God, she did not. <laughs> you know, and I remember my EP said he had the same reaction. You're like, yeah, that's going to leave a mark. Like, that's going to go down a wall. You know, you just, and there's some things you hear, and you're like, that's never going to. Alternative go Facts has away. its own Wikipedia. I know. Location. It's never going to go away. And it was the timing of it, and it was, it was doing it on day one. And, and, you know, the only thing about the interview that I'm upset about is I, I you know, I did laugh at one point. And she it was, called you on that she did. in a big way. And, and, and it was more at the absurdity of the moment. But as, as someone noted, I mean, look, I, I, one of the things that is just a fact about me and, and how I do this job is that, that my body language sometimes is very audible. <laughs> um, and I'm sorry about that sometimes. I, I, you know, but then again, I go back to the, that I go back to this. And I do think that it's interesting. I, I, I find that my job is, if you're going to be dispassionate about it in one way, you got to put yourself in the role of the viewer and, and, and hope you're channeling their sort of, what? You know, and that is, that is sort of how I try to listen for an interview. Some of the viewers will, will give you the what, and other viewers will say, you're an attack dog. 
and you or are, that's gotcha and, and, or whatever. And, it's gotcha yeah. and you're waiting every time you uh, have not. anybody from Trump to pull them apart. Oh, look, on that, I was pissed. I will, no, the day before, I thought that was outrageous. I thought, are you kidding me? You're having Sean Spice. You're doing this on day one. So yeah, I was insulted as a member of the White House press corps, as somebody who worked in that room for six years. So in that sense, I was channeling that rage of like, of wait a minute. And, and I do believe this is one of those things. The first, you're setting the terms of the debate with the White House at the very beginning. You and I talked about this at the time. You set the terms at the very beginning. I, I always say every White House is doing their best to, to um, make it harder to cover them. And each White House has, has whatever the other one has gotten away with, no matter the party of the, uh, of the, of the successor, they grab that new, they grab that, n uh, that new um, line or whatever, or, or, or their, their, their new rules that they were able to establish with a previous press corps and sort of push the envelope even more. So I did feel a sense of, we gotta draw a line on this. We can't have this on day one. So I was, I was ready on this. I mean, I knew this was going to be the sort of topic du jour. There was a second part of the interview that I'd always planned on getting to, which was the president's speech to the CIA that day that had taken place the day before, <laughs> which was just another outrageous moment, like shocking moment. Now we're shocked all the time. I sort of give, you know, I give Rod Rosenstein a little bit of a pass, by the way, going back. You know, when all of this happened, right, right when Comey got fired, he was, they're all like at the Justice Department going, my God, what the hell? We've never dealt with something like this before. Now we're all used to sort of Trump blowing up every norm in the world, which may which, be a problem. Which, which, we're all getting conditioned a, a very to the crazy, that the crazy is normal. This is not normal, and, it's, and it is hard sometimes to jump up and down every third day to scream, hey, this is not normal, what are we doing? But, you know, at some point you have to strike some balance. I want to come back to alternative facts and the challenge that that presents, not just sort of in larger civil discourse, mm -hmm. but in doing the job as a journalist. Steve Roberts is here and Steve covered the White House and I think remembers well that when a president or a press secretary- but Steve doesn't is, know is every member of my staff, he's their favorite person, well, not me. It's not me. Bravo. My whole staff loves Steve Roberts. As he knows, my the person, the person that helps, uh, helps me uh, sort of get through most of my day um, would still pick you over me. <laughs> In any case, uh, Steve knows from his days covering the White House, as do I, that if a president misspoke or a press secretary yeah. misspoke in the past, they'd come out and they'd say, well, what we meant to say. Or they'd, yes. they'd correct the record. We now they correct the transcript. They'd, they would, they yeah. would acknowledge, they yeah. would correct. There was a consequence, it seemed, for making a mistake or getting it wrong. When I hear alternative facts, when you hear alternative facts, we have another sound bite that we'll play in just a moment too, um, it puts us on a completely different plane. How do we in the media, how does the public in hearing all of this, zero in and hold to a account a White House where there are alternative facts? Look, I think this has been a, a a challenge. I've spent a lot of time because I'm working on a project, um, a, a long-term project, and I'll just leave it at that. It's pretty obvious what you guys can guess what it what it would entail. But Several I spent pages, a, perhaps. It, it might have a lot of lot of writing, to it, <laughs> a lot of words. Um, but um, it's a it's about trying to figure out how, you know, how Donald Trump learned politics, and learned to fight this way, and the most important person to teach him how to, uh, how to sort of get along in politics was a gentleman by the name of Roy Cohn. And Roy Cohn is probably one of the 10 most infamous figures, I would say, in American political history in the let's, 20th let's, century. Let's, let's test knowledge. Who did yeah. Roy Cohn work for? Yes? Justice yes, Justice Department, Joe McCarthy. Yeah, that's both, both, both are accurate. Um, the Rosenberg trial, everybody heard of that? Right, there, so you don't get to play. <laughs> um, but Roy Cohn's philosophy was, you know, you never, you never, you, you never admit Never anything. admit it, never Never back admit off. a mistake. You never, you know, you never settle. You know, he first, Donald Trump was being investigated. The, the, the way Donald Trump got hooked up with Roy Cohn, he was being investigated by the Justice Department for um, racial discrimination in his housing um, units. And um, all, he goes, oh, he was at, he was at um, one of these... 1970s clubs in, uh, called Le Club. Yeah, I think 
You know, this was New York in the 70s. They wasn't cool yet, I guess. <laughs> so they're at Le Club. And he's complaining. He meets Roy Cohn and he's complaining. He goes, all these Wall Street firms, they want me to settle. And Cohn's like, you never settle. And so they countersue the Justice Department for reputational damage. You know, that you bringing this. And, and th the point is, this is the Roy Cohn way. And this is what Donald Trump is, you know, his, it, it is, his it is to fight. And then Roy Cohn taught him how to do it. You know, he wanted to fight. That was his instinct anyway. And Roy Cohn just told him how to do it right and how to do it well and how to do it in a way that will make your opponents go crazy, that will make your opponents make mistakes. I mean, it's, it, it, is, it is, in some ways, he was, um, he, was, he was both the most feared lawyer and yet that fear, every mobster wanted him, um, and yet that fear also made him a celebrity. I mean, you know, it also is the he worst part a, of, you know, like Barbara Walters. There's he, nobody that, that sort of mainstreamed him more he went than Barbara on Walters. For, he went on forever. Right. No, he I mean, and, 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 and look, I don't want to just pick on her, but it wasn't, you know, he was also very manipulative of the press. Roy Cohn understood how to manipulate. He became oh, he the best He learned from McCarthy. He learned, oh, it was, and McCarthy is just like, Trump is, Trump is just like McCarthy. So McCarthy had a habit. You know, he'd tell the evening newspaper guys back when they had evening newspapers, and he'd say, I got a big announcement in the morning. Wouldn't tell them what it was, but all the evening newspapers guys would write the big, coming, the big announcements coming in the morning, right? So the afternoon papers have all of this, and he's got some, some big list he's going to unveil. And then the next morning, they're like, oh, what do you got? I don't know. What are you talking about? Um, but then he'd have something else, and he'd feed the morning wire guys. I mean, McCarthy, it's very similar afternoon papers where the Twitter, were sort of equivalent of how Trump uses the the, his Twitter feed. So any, the point is, is I've spent a lot of time understanding Roy Cohn a little bit and seeing the mistakes that our colleagues in the 50s made. Um, some of this is repeating itself. Okay, we have, you know, there were news organizations that were essentially not wholly owned by the Roy Cohn wing of, of the political world, but certainly his relationship with Walter Winchell and all of that. Yeah, but stuff. it took a very long time, Chuck, for the for the press to call out That's Joe right. McCarthy. It, did. it, took, it took about twelve seconds for the press to start calling out Donald Trump, and we're in a and we're in a very different world. So I'm not sure right. how how. Well, but the point is, is that you've got to sort of. I think you've got to see how it worked then, to understand where the you know now that every allegation they're going to deflect and deny. So at least when you know that going in, it allows you to plan for an interview better. Okay, let's talk about another interview, because i got another clip here for you. Um, but set it up for us. You're interviewing Rudy Giuliani. This is fairly recent. This is fairly recent. Right. Um, what was the backdrop? What was the news backdrop as you sat down with um, it? Well, obviously, it's Mueller-related. I think this has had to be after the Manafort trial. Yep. Um, the first guilty set of guilty verdicts, I think. If I'm... That's correct. You know, if I, if I put this together... You know, Scott Pruitt resigned in July. You know, that was, that was only two months ago. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I do remind people, it's like, it is stunning, like, what, what has happened um, since just the so 4th of July. So the two of you yes. are talking about the fallout. Let's take a look. What I have to tell you is, look, I'm not going to be rushed into having him testify so that he gets trapped into perjury. And when you tell me that, you know, he should testify because he's going to tell the truth and he shouldn't worry, well, that's so silly because it's somebody's version of the truth, not the truth. He didn't have a, a conversation. Truth is about, truth. I, I don't mean to go like. I, no, I it isn't truth. Truth isn't truth. The president of the United States says I didn't. Truth is a I, truth. Mr. Mayor, do you realize what I. I, I no, I, no, no. This is going to become a bad don't, 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 do, don't, do, don't do this to me. Don't do truth uh, is Donald a truth Trump, to me. Donald Trump says I didn't talk about Flynn with Comey. Comey says, you did talk about it. So tell me what the truth is. Are we ever going to figure out the truth? I think so. I'm, I'm not going to be, I think we will. I think we're getting, I think we're getting there all the time. I, do. I, think, I think we're getting closer all the time. I think, you know, I was heartened by the fact that at the end of the day, and that's why I go back to why Rod Rosenstein has to resign. The system, look, the guardrails are going to get dented. The guardrails are going to get knocked off the road and we're going to have to put some of these guardrails back but we have to hope the system sort of is how it work we work ourselves out this way um, I happen to believe the voters are the ones that it would always be better if voters kick out a president than if the system kicks out the president um, but it needs to play itself out 
in a way where we can have the institution look like it knows what it's doing. Because we're, we're, we're sort of so tearing down these institutions. I'm really, you know, we're, I think a lot of people are concerned about um, the damage that's been done to the FBI. You know, and that, and that you, I mean, you just know how many FBI agents are going to get called to the stand on retrials, you know, based using some of the president's rhetoric Chuck, I, uh, I, on this. More than, more than prosecutors want to have to deal with. Chuck, I want to turn to the, the, the piece you wrote in The Atlantic and mm -hmm. the thoughts you have about how the, the press, the media, need to respond to this. But I do want to ask you this. I heard your body language there, too. Right. So did Giuliani. The question... By the way, I was trying to help him. In an I, odd I don't way. Think he, I don't think he took it that no, way. No, I know. I'm like, what are you doing? Like, don't do that. You know, and he goes, and, and you're sitting there. You're, I, in that sense, I gave him an out. I gave him an opportunity to like, yeah, 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 I didn't mean it that way. And he's like, no, 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 I meant it that way. Chuck, and you're you, like, okay. Do but you, I, I don't even feel like that was a gotcha. This is, this is just, I put, I booked Rudy Giuliani. <laughs> As we say, you just wind him up. Do you, do you ever feel that your... Turns out the best Trump interviews, by the way, are the, are the ones with his sycophants. Because the sycophants don't follow up. And he just starts rambling on. And it's during those ramble moments that he, that he um, has dug, in, dug himself a couple of holes recently. In fact, Kellyanne and I had a conversation about this. And I said, you know, bring him out. I said, I said, I probably keep him on message better. Simply because I'm trying to follow up on whatever he's trying and to what say. Did Kelly, what did Kelly and she Ann said, no, he, he, he stays on message better in tougher interviews than he does in softball interviews. Where and I'm you, like, well, him? then bring him on. Let's go. Chuck, do you ever, when you, when you look back at your shows and you, and, you know, I, I hear everything you're saying, I yeah. think we all do, that you um, effectively have stepped over the line, that you have decided that Donald Trump is a, a, a very bad thing for this country. Yeah, I, that, I, that, by the way, I don't he, think that. I mean, I, I just don't accept that premise for what it's worth. Okay. I, I, look, I, I believe in the wisdom of voters, of the voters. And I say this the, 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 because the, the perception of those who attack the media yeah. and who, who say that they are in constant attack mode mm -hmm. on Donald Trump would point to CNN, my alma mater, yeah. would point to your shows, would say it's not, Donald Trump's 91% of the coverage is negative. It feeds this notion of the opposition party, the press is the opposition right. party, that there's this deep state. Is it, that this, okay, this is it part. negative? Why is it negative? I, I thought we were covering a disruptive president. No, 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 no. You're covering I mean a this. disruptive president, but when you're you know, rolling your eyes and laughing when you've got guests on. When they're and, lying to me, yeah. Okay. They're, I mean, if they're, if they're, when they're sitting there not telling me the truth, yes. I'm letting, but I don't sit here and say Donald Trump's presidency. I mean, Donald Trump's, the country decided to disrupt But they would say to you, the have, you have you interviewed the Treasury Secretary on the strength of the economic recovery? I've been trying to book the Treasury Secretary for six months. He won't come on. Um, but would you interview him on the strength of the recovery if you had it? I would love to interview him on the strength strength of this recovery but is it a, you know do we want to go down that road we can go down that road we're happy to go down that road i've you know i had this question someone said well for every story you do on Mueller, do a story on the economy i said there's not you know we're in the news business there's an existential threat to the presidency that's the biggest story every day there's an existential threat to the presidency um we cover the economy yes when there's good news in the economy we cover it when there's bad news in the economy we cover it um, but the key word is N-E-W. You don't continue to cover another plane land safely at National today. Right? We don't cover that news. So the, the economy is good again today. I mean, I don't mean it like, it's just, there's only, I mean, you know, yes, you know I'm, I'm, I'm speaking I, rhetorically to you here on this front. But it's, you know, there's the first three letters of news is what? New, N-E-W. Here's what you wrote in The Atlantic. There's a new kind of campaign underway. One that most of my colleagues and I have never publicly reported on, never fully analyzed, and never fully acknowledged. The campaign to destroy the, the, the legitimacy of the American news media. If journalists are going to defend the integrity of their work, you continue, and the role it plays in sustaining democracy, we're going to need to start fighting back. What do you mean? Here's what I meant. So for 25 years, um, that I've been doing this job, and I would argue it goes back to, um, I'm going to use a phrase here that a few of you will know, nattering nabobs of negativism. Um, all right, what student can tell me who said that? Were you a student? <laughs> nah, I didn't think that was a student. That's right. 
Freshman back there. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, and it is sort of, it has been this, it has been a fixation, and it goes back to a lot of the Nixon loyalists who are still angry to this day, um, were, were for angry for a long time about the press's role in Watergate. And in the, as far as Nixon and the, and the foot soldiers of Roger Ailes, Spiro Agnew was a part of that, obviously. Um, Roger Stone cut his teeth in, in Nixon land. Um, the belief was Pat Buchanan, speechwriter back then, Bill Sapphire, speechwriter back then. But the belief was that, the, that it was a fact the press was biased against Nixon. And, I, and, and so therefore, it was the press that took down Nixon, not Nixon's own acts, which of course took down Nixon. The press covered it. Um, the press uncovered it in, in many ways and covered it. Um, but it has been a, and, it, and, it, and it's, you see it and it was, if you think about it, the modern campaign against the press right. started then. And it accelerated with Limbaugh. That was the first accelerant. Uh, and then 96 happens, and the second accelerant is the founding of Fox News by a Nixon political operative. And, you know, for all, I mean, the irony always has been is that the chief antagonist, the chief, the person who essentially was the chief strategist for this campaign to prove that the mainstream media was biased against conservatives um, was a political operative who ran a network in a biased way. And sort of, you know, it was the ultimate in projection, right? And how we let that get legitimacy, because we thought, oh, no, 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 nobody's gonna believe that, because, oh my God, it's a Nixon operative saying it. Or no one's gonna believe it because they know that it's coming from a biased point of view. Um, but if you say something long enough and you don't push back, like any campaign, and it was relentless, it's sort of like, you know, it just kept coming. I mean. It's the weirdest thing. I have been personally attacked. My wife has been personally attacked by, the, by these, by these primetime hosts on Fox. And any time I said anything it, it remotely critical, like an illusion, remotely critical of Roger Ailes, the next day, a goon on Fox and Friends and, or, or, or somebody on, on primetime would take this weird shot at myself or my wife. And they'd do it to everybody else. And they personalized every story. And you just sit there and say, None of us would ever go and do it, that, you know, never call out somebody else individually. And, it, and it, I've just, we've sat here and we were always told, don't engage. And you sit here and take it and you're like, at the end of the day, I've been character assassinated for 40% of the country. Who has been told what an awful person I am because my wife happens to be a Democrat. So, um, but it has been this and they've been, and it's personalized and it's done, it's, we're called un-American. Look. I know that the, the journalists of the civil rights movement had to deal with worse, okay? And, and it was a similar, you know, just the journalists were covering the civil rights movement, therefore people who didn't want to see um, equal rights attacked the press for, for simply covering the civil rights movement. Um, so I know why we're getting attacked, but I do think we have just allowed it to happen for so long that part of restoring our credibility. I'm not saying we haven't made mistakes, and I'm not saying there isn't cultural bias um, in, the network, in, in, in the network leadership. In fact, I talk about it all the time, and every time I talk about it, it gets misused by, by some crazy commentator who then says, see, Chuck Todd says there's bias at NBC. I said, no, it's not what I said. I said, there's a cultural bias of people that live in New York and not understanding you know, the li life there, there, of, of there, somebody there, in Arkansas, there really or understand the gun culture, yeah. or understand that on Wednesday nights is church night in the South, that, that there are cultural disconnects that create, that, that create the perception that it's a bias, it's some sort of intentional bias against the, other there people's are two, cultures. There, there are two separate things that you're saying, and they're both very much worth mm -hmm. understanding and exploring. One is the cultural bias, the East Coast bias, and sometimes, Which is real. The and sometimes the liberal bias that exists in and has existed in much of mainstream media. Well, just, we're okay. also blurring and, activist journalism well, into mainstream well, media, and that's that another, that's well, another we've problem. We've moved in a whole, whole different direction. Yes. But the other issue that you raise in your piece and in your comments right now is the particular approach 
to news or right. to media that Fox and Rush Limbaugh and others who've taken, which is a, an attack, a demonization, mm -hmm. a what um, a fellow by the name of Ben Nemo refers to as hyper-emotional interpretation, right. which has a very deleterious effect on public discourse. One, but, of, my, one of Rush's favorite expressions, he likes to refer to the media as the drive-by, the people that do the drive-bys. The irony is, who's doing the drive-by? Who's, he drive-bys and, and takes shots at me personally all the time. The, the, that's a drive-by. All right, so you say... I, you know, and so you, you, that's you, the irony, is so, that he does the drive-by so so with you, the accusation so of you, a drive-by. So you write, instead of attacking rivals or assailing critics, going negative in the parlance of political campaigns, reporters need to showcase and defend our reporting. And here's what you say. I'm not uh, advocating for a more activist press in the political sense, but for a more aggressive one. Right. What do you mean, a more aggressive one? So, I look at it this way, um, and it's something that a, a, my, my background was working at a campaign trade publication for 15 years. We loved the horse race. We, you know, before there was 538, before there was Politico, before there's been anything you've ever heard of, real clear politics polling average, there was the hotline. All right, and I was the chief dealer. You know, I was the political junkie dealer, and I, and, and I celebrated the horse race, and I loved that back and forth. Mistake? Um, no. I was, I was writing for professionals, so I don't believe we didn't make the mistake. We were writing for professionals. We were a campaign trade organ publication for professionals who were digesting it. We were not trying to write for the masses. We were not trying to bring political insider gossip in that helps the campaigns go to the masses. That was a decision made by, made by other political entities. You had Mark Halpern in the note, right. ABC sort of kick-started it. Then you had Politico. Politico now is, I guess, Axios. But I think the public wants a more, I think the press, one of the jobs of the press is to channel where the public is, not tell the, where the public should so be. So what do you want a so more I'm aggressive press to do? To be a bit more dispassionate, not give it, not give it, not care about access. So, so what if you ask a question that makes this person not want to come back? If it's a pertinent question, like you don't just you don't just attack, you don't just ask the uncomfortable question just for uncomfortable questions. So you think sake. this is all about access? No, but I think that's part of it. I think that I mean, some if the of press the, is going to fight back from being called the enemy of the people, the opposition party. I think they have to be dishonest. It's got to be more than I'm not right. going to let you on the air. No, 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 no. But it's 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 a combination of being less chummy. I mean, that, that that's sort of number one. Like I, I get that. I think that the biggest perceived mistake of the 16 campaign, and I think one of the messages that there was a perception, and again, I think most of it was falsely created by by this campaign. But there was a perception we were a bit too chummy. Um, and there's some truth to that. You, you, you just, it is. It's by nature. This is a company Chuck, I think, I think the problem, but, the, but the, I, challenge, I, the challenge. But I do think that for the public, they want something a bit more um, clinically, dis, a little more clinical, a little more dispassionate, and a little more. But aggressive. are you, when you're talking about being more aggressive, are you saying, we should be going after, the press no, should be going after. Not after people, after the story. Be more aggressive at reporting the story out more. Be more, uh, you know, so it, 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 in television, we surf the news when we cover it. Yeah. Every once in a while, we, we think, you know what, we have the capacity to go deep on this and we can do it better than a print publication, so we're gonna do that, right? But you have to pick your spots in television. Um, there's resource demand, there's only a finite, you know, I don't have A4, right? I only have one screen, right? So, um, but I think that, so when I say we're being more aggressive, okay, then we need to show that we're a complete reporting shop, for instance. So I think the reason it's been good for NBC that we're now competing for print stories too with the Post and the Times. We're on our digital platform. And, and I think that, it, that it, it helps our credibility if we're covering a wider array of stories that matter to folks. You have, you know, it's, we, we could go on like this. On this I, one look, for a, for a very here's long the problem time. when the, I wrote the, this piece because you got, you caught, you've, you've caught the hardest part, part of this is what's the solution? Because the solution in a campaign would be what? 
find your own super PAC donor and start running counterattack ads. Or start running positive ads about yourself. Right. Right? Like that's what you would do in a campaign. Well, maybe, maybe, maybe the I media, do maybe think we do need a little to, positive on ourselves. Maybe the journal, well, people do not understand what we do yeah. or how we do it. Mm -hmm or what goes into it, and so it becomes easy to pounce on it when you see what you don't like from either side. Right, right. no, I mean like a great, so, uh, let, me, let me ask you this, because uh, I've been asked this today. You've read the New Yorker story? Uh-huh, uh -huh. the, the Deborah Ramirez story? Would you have put that on CNN? No. I wouldn't have put it on NBC. By the way, we didn't. We had this, we, we, we've been working on this story for a week. We didn't think we had enough. We had the name, we, had, we knew everything about it, but there, there wasn't a there there. We couldn't, we couldn't confirm, you know, she thinks it happened. I take her, at her, you know, I believe she believes this. That's not the point. But this is a huge charge. You can't unring the bell. You know, and this, this whole thing, I mean, and this is this whole thing about Kavanaugh, I think it bothers so many of us for this reason, is that you can't unring a bell. And once... You know, I, I think it's now impossible for him to serve, and I don't know if that's fair. You or think not. it's impossible? For I him think to it's serve? impossible for him to serve. You think the nomination in a fair way? And I, you know, that doesn't mean do he won't end up serving, but I think that there will be a good chunk of the country, and maybe half of it, that won't believe he. Why could would be it be fair. any more impossible for him to serve than Clarence Thomas? The, the, I think the, it's the noise changed. around Clarence yes. Thomas was much worse, much more credible. And guess what? I believe that he's a different justice because of it. Oh, there's no doubt about it. Right. He's a human being. That's the point. That's right. And I actually, you make, you are, you bring up Thomas and I'll say, that's why we shouldn't do it. Because Thomas, there's no doubt in my mind someone gave him the advice, boy, you better lay low the first year. Right? Which would be totally rational advice to give somebody after he had been through all that. So he lays low for a year. A year becomes two. Two becomes five. Five becomes 20, right? And now it's the mute. Justice Thomas, the mute, right? He's always wanting to, quote, stick it to the left in his opinions. I don't know if that's the case, but if you believe you were railroaded the way he believes he was railroaded, do you think it might impact your decision making every once in a while? You're a human being. Again, I, I, I hope it did, doesn't. I'd like to believe it doesn't, but I worry that it might. You can't tell me you go through something like this, it doesn't embitter you in some way or the other, and you have to go up there and be as the most important impartial person, the, one of the most nine impartial people we have got to have in a crisis? You've interviewed Lisa Murkowski, you've interviewed Susan Collins, you've interviewed- I've not interviewed Lisa Murkowski. She's interviewed the most elusive senator in the land. Oh, I thought you'd talk about No. Jeff Flake? Yes. Okay. And, so but you, Lisa you, Murkowski, you, if you're listening, <laughs> You know. They're coming under intense pressure from yeah. conservatives, from the Freedom Caucus, from women. How do they vote? Because their vote matters. This was the question that I asked, that I've been asking every senator that I've had since we've had this thing is, explain to me how you're gonna decide who's more credible. I don't know. I think we all have our own test, right? You sort of, there's a famous Supreme Court um, ruling, was it, was it, who, who did the pornography uh, line? But if you, you'll, you, it, you'll know it if you it, see it. it was, was that Wizard White's line? I think it was Wizard White, right, when he wrote that opinion where he's like, I, you know, trying to define what's, porno, what's pornographic. I don't know, but you know, it when you, you know it when you see it. So I think that's the way we're all going to be when we watch this hearing on Thursday that, God, I hope it doesn't happen because I just don't think our country's politics can handle it. But I, I just say that just in another explosion at some point. How many more of these fraying cultural clashes can, can the country handle? Um, but there's no definitive way. If we have no, as someone brought up, the, and if, if we don't have the footage, right? We don't have, this isn't Black Mirror. We can't go and rewind the brains and show, and maybe, maybe when you guys um, come onto the gun. By the way, as we now find out, remember when they talked about your permanent record? The permanent record actually is real, huh? There is a permanent record. There's a permanent record. There's a permanent record. There will always be somebody that brings up your permanent record. I want to go to audience questions in a minute, so if you have one, start making your way to the mic. While you do that, Chuck, you have about 3.2 million viewers on a typical Sunday, something like that. You lead in the precious 25 to 54 
Democrat we lead in all category. of it. Yeah, supposedly. Yeah. We won this season for a second year in a row. Yeah, but I saw that Face the Nation knocked your total viewers Just out. For, one week. For, for a week. In any case, yeah. you have three million plus. It's not the audience the television once had. It's still a very large audience. Scott Nover here wrote about the role of the Sunday show. What do you see, very briefly, because we got lots of questions here, mm -hmm. what do you see as your role? in a weird world that doesn't revolve around real-time television anymore, appointment viewing. Right. Well, well you, look, I used to, what I, my answer before the, before the Trump era was simply, look, and I still believe ultimately that the mission of, of Meet, Meet the Press works is at its best when it translates Washington for America and translates America for Washington, right? That that's the bottom line, okay? And I'm well aware, I'm one of those shows that Washington watches, you know, and, and, and you have sort of, um, what I would call, it's, it's both thought leaders and then that next level down. I mean, one of the interesting things when we did, when I got the job, they handed me all this viewer research. And the number one reason people watch any Sunday show, but Meet the Press, was to just be smarter, get educated. They just want to learn more about, most people would, it said, so I can talk at work or so I can, you know, it's more about, like, in a, in a very sort of, in the same way they would, you know, might want to, um, you know, uh, audit a class, you know, audit, audit a class on constitutional law. It's like they view a Sunday show program as a way of auditing a civics class because they didn't get time during the week to do that. So I always say the mission basically is that. I'm translating Washington for America and America for Washington. In the Trump era, it has been about, because everything has been, there's just, there's just a constant churn. And that's why I go back, that's why I refuse to call this a negative, we're covering a disruptive president. Carter, all of the coverage of Carter was negative because it was disruptive. When you're, cover, when stuff, when, when you're stirring stuff up, the coverage of it is, oh, change. And the coverage of change is there's usually people complaining about the change. I mean, it's just inherently going to feel negative to the person making the change, and I get that. But it's, we're covering a very disruptive president. So now I do view that one of our jobs is to sift. We're a sifter for the week and sort of what mattered and what didn't. I would and say, I do think that in the Trump era, I, I find that that's certainly what I'm trying to accomplish in the first 10 minutes of the show is to give you a sense of what mattered and what didn't this week and what's going to matter and what's not for the next week. I would simply observe before we go to your questions that you have an opportunity with all the noise out there that may be a greater and more important opportunity than we've had before because there is so much noise, yeah. because there needs to be a place. And there are very few formats and very few places where you can go, thank you, Jen. Thank you. Is that water or something else? Oh, okay. <laughs> Yours is water. Okay. Uh, so let us start. I'm, let, we'll go quickly back and forth. Why don't we take two at a time, okay, so we can make more, okay. more tracks. Tell us Each time. your name, yeah. your, if you're Ranked, a student, what you're number. studying, and then quickly your question, and we'll go and get as many in as we can. Sure. Uh, hi, Chuck. Thanks for being here. Uh, my name's Greg. I'm a freshman at the Elliott School. Um, and I wanted to ask something about um, alternative media that has, that has been coming to prominence um, over the past couple of years. Um, I know that a lot of people my age, um, you know, left or right, are starting to move away from traditional cable news mm -hmm. and or print news and are going to, um, you know, podcasters, people on, on YouTube, mm -hmm. um, you know, Steven Crowder, Dave Rubin, uh, Ben Shapiro, the Young Turks, um, you know, all these, all these mm -hmm. different people are coming into prominence. Um, what do you think is a positive of that trend, and what do you think is a danger of that trend? Okay. Okay. All right. Let's we'll come back. This one Next. There, yeah. Hey, Chuck. Uh, yeah, I'm Gavin. I'm a student veteran here at GW, majoring in political science. Uh, as someone who got chewed out multiple times in the military for my nonverbal reactions, I greatly empathize with that condition. <laughs> um, so my question uh, regarding is uh, the Trump rallies and Sarah, excuse me, Sarah Sanders press conferences. Mm -hmm. The debate over, you know, should those be live? Uh, should they be covered uh, to the extent that they're covered? Uh, I'm just curious to hear your reaction uh, and your position on that. You got it. All right. Thanks, Gavin. Let's start with Greg's question. Alternative uh, media, Young Turks, and on it goes. Uh, look, it's all it's all good, and what's going to happen is it's all going to eventually consolidate uh, at some point. Um, no, I say this in that it you, you see a taste of it. Was, somebody was asking me an earlier question, sort of. I think. What's been interesting about where we are now, if you go back 100 years of the history of radio, everybody had their own radio station and everybody launched their own thing. And then eventually it sort of, um, Tom Brokaw used, likes to use this phrase, we're in the middle of this big bang. 
And, and that's what happened, right? We've, we've sort of, the, the media went through this, you know, the internet created this big bang and we have all this, and it's still sorting out. But, so we have all these, and it, it is the best of times for entrepreneurial journalism, what, what you described, you have the, the barrier to entry has never been lower, um, and that's a positive. Um, there's a lot of people, though, that can quickly act like an expert, but they aren't, and quickly gain a following, right? That's the downside the Alex Jones effect, right? How quickly, you know, um, I know the guys behind Young Turks, I know they care about facts, so I don't think they're an Alex Jones type of, you know what I mean? I get that, but the thing is for the, you know, to the average person, if you're watching it on YouTube, can you really tell the difference? Wow. You, you know, I don't mean it. Would, don't, you no. can by, by maybe ideology, but you don't, on one hand you think, oh geez, they have all this, um, decent equipment, so maybe they know what they're doing. You know, you don't know how, so I do think that vetting it is obviously, is obviously difficult. I think what's gonna happen is that, you know, I'm still, a, I believe in capitalism, and I believe in the free market. And I think the free market does sip this out. Um, I think the free market's working right now in Alex Jones. You know, I'm, I'm sorry, so the people have risen up and have forced Twitter to do what they're doing, that's the market working. Whether you like it or not, the market is speaking. It's not government speaking. I'd have a big problem if government were doing this to Alex Jones. I have less of a problem if it's being sort of, it's, it's sort of the market is speaking. Um, and I think that that's, I think we need to have a little more patience um, with that. So I will say this, I can tell you this, we as a quote mainstream media view it as a potential competitor. So that's why I'm getting into the documentary business. That's why I'm getting, I want us to do more podcasting. We have, um, we're doing an Insta, in, 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 what, Insta Instagram. story. Sorry. <laughs> Not well. <laughs> no new media here, right? Yes. <laughs> we're taking our television show and trying to put it in a little box on your phone. <laughs> um, look, we're obviously, and I think what you're going to see is, is you're going to see the, what happened in radio is that there was just acquisitions. And you're going to see, so the entrepreneur, what succeeds is you will continue to see media companies try to, I, I would say, broaden their um, scope of the, of, the, of the people that they will have on. And, and I think the, the challenge is going to be as you, as you widen the array of, of people on your op-ed page, be careful how that might impact the perception of your news division. Um, and so that's going to continue to be a challenge for us and other All right, let's, go, let's go over to Thanks Gavin's so question on, um, take, on the rallies. Them. Look. I, th I, I wish that I want to get rid of the White House press briefing on television. It was put on television during the Monica Lewinsky scandal. Mike when, McCurry says it's one of the biggest mistakes he ever made. Right, because Frank says no at CNN insisted on having programming in the middle of the afternoon. And it's pretty close. Yeah. <laughs> if CNN didn't need programming in the middle of the afternoon in the 90s, that sucker never would have been on television. <laughs> So it's Frank's fault. We didn't make them do it. Yeah, okay. you know, remember they, there was no other cable channel. It was channels. a great idea at the time. Um, I, I look. I used to beg Robert Gibbs to take them off. I was one of the few TV people. You because, did? Oh yeah. Because, Why? Because all the TV, everybody preens. Everybody, and here's what happens: our bosses sometimes watch, and then your bosses want to. No, no, no. And and literally, I, I just refused to to do this. But I had others, other correspondents and um, who were, St Steve, you, Steve will know this, that this is done a lot, where the, the correspondent is told by the producer, you know, we, we want to capture your question to Sarah Sanders today. We want to capture your question. So really animate it, mic yourself up. So then you've just, and by the way, then the person behind the podium knows, all right, I got to be, I got to be in, I got to be performing. You know, it, can I just tell you, the back and forth and getting information out of the White House is a lot easier. You turn the goddamn camera off. So, <laughs> and if my job is to simply facilitate information from the White House to the American public about what the hell's the president doing today, I don't want to press So Gavin so, asked about both Sarah Sanders the rallies, and the rallies. Right. And that's, so these are two different things. I think there are days where the public needs to know where does the White House stand, and there's a crisis of the moment, and I think that you make those decisions on a, on a news, news case when it comes to Sarah Sanders. On the rallies, he's the president. Um, I wouldn't televise him unless there is something you expect to hear from him. But I have to tell you, I think that we're trying to, 
There's nothing wrong with waiting for him, if he make news for us, to then play it back. So I think just covering them live is certainly something that we, ha we, have, we have changed our philosophy on it a lot. Have you changed your policy? Um, Change your threshold? I think every, here's what's happened at MS. Every, we, the individual show, has been empowered to make these decisions. So what is your decision? Rally. I wouldn't, it, it, I, I, I am a tape playback person. Listen for it, we'll bring you anything that we think matters. Okay, next question. Let's go to the next round of questions so we get some more in here, go ahead. Hi, my name is Michael Kohler, I'm a freshman. I study political communications in the SMPA here. Uh, my question is whether or not you believe uh, the Trump fake news revolution, if you will, is a cause or effect of the di people's distrust in the media, whether or not you believe that's true, where do you think the media goes from here? How do you think we evolve from this time where a large po part of the portion of the population, bottom line, thinks you're fake news. Where do you think we mm -hmm. go from here? Okay. Okay. Next. Good evening, Mr. Todd. First of all, thank you so much for coming back to GW. My name is Henry. I'm a junior in Elliott School studying international affairs. This question relates to alternative media. In recent years, we are seeing a plummering amount of a plumbery amount of numbers when it comes to uh, foreign 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 government founded news channels like France 24, Al Jazeera, CGTN, and the most famous one, Russia Today (RT). Now, my question is, how will these news channels supported by the foreign governments influence the new influence the political and media spectrum of the United States as a whole? Thank you. That's a, it's a very, very, question. very interesting question. Great question. Thank right. you very much. Let's start with Michael and the evolution of media. Look, it has been interesting. You know, the perception of the media's numbers are actually up right now. Um, it's probably mostly just coming from independents and Democrats, less from Republicans and Fox viewers. Um, I think a lot of it, I'll be honest, I, I, I have, and, and Frank's heard me use this expression, I believe, I believe um, this is our, 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 our Iraq war. And um, I wasn't at NBC during the Iraq war. I was still at the hotline. Um, I'm not trying to like wash my hands of it, but, let, when I, but I guess what I'm saying is, I say we in the mainstream media um, blew it in Iraq. It's, and I think the combination of blowing in Iraq and missing the, um, the Great Recession, missing that that was, that was coming or not sounding the alarm, I'd argue, there's certainly plenty of coverage that the housing bubble, the housing bubble is going to burst housing, but, but not truly sounding the alarm. Um, that this is, if we mess this up, you know, if we've, if we've got this wrong on Trump, okay, um, I don't know if we recover. I'm not sure I understand. If we get, if we mess what up, it, it, we this, don't recover from what? It, it, the, the, his ask, I, I think this, if, if it's, if the perception is essentially we whiffed on Trump, we whiffed on how we covered him. We, you know, either how we did it didn't, it, it, it exacerbated the situation or made him stronger, you know, as I joke in 2032 when he's, when he's taking the oath for his fourth term. Oh, and you guys are going, well, how did this happen? Um, I'm only half kidding about that. No, I'm kidding. Um, I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. But the point is, is if it's, I think if it, I think if we get this right, and the public will see it. And I think, they're, you know, in the same way the press got rewarded post-Watergate in Vietnam, took a little while, but the, but the press did get sort of rewarded there, realizing, you know what, those, for at the end of the day, they were digging this stuff up, and they were trying to get it right. And this um, fake news and, stuff, all this fake news goes away, it remains a scar, it's something that the media well, has to address Well, especially if it turns out forward. everything that we've been reporting has been accurate. I would, I would simply say that I think it's a very interesting point. I would say this. I think it's very dangerous for the press to just sort of shrug this off. Well, there, are shrug it off very, right? there are very legitimate concerns about where the media comes from, mm -hmm. how journalism is done, that well predate Donald Trump. This, mm -hmm. this, and and there's, there's too much, well, we're just going to do our job. We're just going to keep doing no, our no, no, job. No, 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 and, and we, that's all well a, and There's good. an explanation that's, that's owed to the public right. and a transparency that the, the journalism right. itself needs to have as it insists that and everybody else and every other institution. That, that's have. exactly right. But, but the, none of this is going to be taken seriously until conservatives hold conservative media accountable. Let's go to, Greg, uh, to Henry's question. Sorry. On, uh, or, on, on this. This is, uh, you know, 
You know who, um, all of these countries are just borrowing a tactic from the United States. Right. Something called Voice of America. Right. <laughs> I learned English from the Voice of America. There you go. And we actually um, have a former Voice of America director in the room. And where's John Lansing? Now, I, <laughs> and, I, I, and, and he's going to say, we're not RT. <laughs> and it's not RT. But the point is. Not at all. Putin would not, say it is. But it's not at right? all. Right. This is the whataboutism. Right. This is, this is Putin's rationale for RT right. is what's the difference between this and Voice of America? What's the difference between this and the BBC? Right? BBC, simply just a, just a, 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 a British so, government owned. So, to his question, how much influence do you think the Al Jazeera's, the CGTN's, the others have on either the, our political process or on other media? Um, RT has more influence than I ever thought. I don't think they have a lot, but they have more than you think with conservatives. It has become because they have cleverly taken sides in the war in this country on the mainstream media, and the mainstream media is criticizing RT, right? The enemy of my enemy is my friend, so it's an alliance of sorts, I'm not saying. So I think that that has helped. That's where RT's been very clever. It's been very interesting, though, you talk about, you brought up, um, CC, you brought up a- CGTN. CGTN. Chinese television. Chinese television. China Daily is also very clever with this. There was a Des Moines, in today's, in, uh, Sunday's Des Moines Register, because I saw somebody tweet this today. Sunday's Des Moines Register, the insert is a full page ad advertorial from China, China Daily. Its lead story is about um, how China is going to start buying soybeans from South, South America. Um, this is in the Des Moines Register, okay, <laughs> state of Iowa. But that talk about an interesting way to use, first of all, an interesting decision by the Des Moines Register to accept paid advertising that looked like a newspaper insert. It was paid advertising to, to look like a newspaper insert. So my point is, I think this is having more and more of an effect. The, the, again, it's tactics the United States has used for decades. Right. And we would argue we've been using some of these tactics to spread freedom and democracy. Promote democracy. And to promote democracy. Right. Sometimes we've done it in nefarious ways, too. We don't use Voice of America to do the nefarious stuff. Um, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it, it, it is... Look, we're, this is, this is a, a real challenge, but again, I think we haven't done a good enough job in the press of even telling people about RT. Let's go to the back, we should. Let's go the back of the much. room for someone, and then we'll come back to the questions. Go ahead. Hi, uh, Bryce. I'm a freshman hey, political Bryce. science major. Uh, my question is, how do you think the Me Too movement affected your coverage as well as the media in general's coverage of the Kavanaugh confirmations? Um, I don't, I will just say this. I've rethought every action I've ever committed as a man in the Me Too movement. I mean that. I, and I don't know how else to say it. Um, I have tried to figure out how to put my, you know, my wife has told me more stories than she hadn't told me before about experiences she's had. Really? Uh -huh. um, people at work have, sh have shared more, uh, more stories. So, you're just, you're asking, how to, I, I'll just tell you that I, I have just, um, I, I get it, and I'm sort of, I, I'm not saying I, I get it, but I, I have spent a lot, of, a, a lot more time on it than I expected, I guess is, an, is another way of putting so it. I, I think this is a, I think, you know, it's, it's funny, it's one of the, I thought my generation was going to be the one to, to bring this in, and we didn't, so I'm sort of, a, sort of disappointed in us. Gen X a little bit, um, I'm so, you know, I thought we, we, were, we were the first generation raised that raised with the idea of gender equality in the workplace, but it didn't happen. I didn't have a female boss until three years ago. So I obviously, it, you know, we have, a long, we, have a long, we have a long way to go. Um, and so it, I've thought about how you see, you see how we've got, and I've, and I've, I've thought about it, you asked about Kavanaugh, and I've gone back and forth on this issue of, Kellyanne Conway said something very interesting this morning, and she goes, you know, it's not fair, it isn't fair for the entire Me Too movement to basically be on this man's shoulders. And I, and I thought, on one hand, I understand what she's saying, and I, and I get that line. I thought that was a, I thought it was a very, a good 
a good line, a good defense line, but also something that made me think a little bit. And it's an interesting question. Does, does this, because it's all about, should, she was also making the argument that, hey, when he, when he actually got power as a judge, he didn't use his power to, to grope women, essentially, or to do this. He, the only accusations that have been made against him are when he didn't have power, when he was in high school or college. And I thought, okay, that's an interesting spin, interesting defense there. Um, but then it made me think, okay, well, how are women here in this? And, you know, and I obviously, I, 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 it's very possible, I, and I've had this conversation with, and women have had this conversation with me, that while we could say it's not fair that if, if that what Kavanaugh did in high school and college, and let's say it was two bad drunken nights, let's give him, let's, let's give the benefit of the doubt of two horrendous nights, and the only nights in his life he ever made this mistake. And you say to yourself, does it, should it, should it impact him or not? And I've had women that I care about a lot say to me, here's the thing, if he's not, if he's re if still rewarded with a Supreme Court seat, then all you're doing is sending the message that the boys will be boys, it's still okay in college. And if you're ever going, to, and so I understand if we're ever going to change this cycle, then there has to be a penalty. So you've asked how I've, and so I understand why there is so much anger out there that maybe he gets this anyway. And I, so I get it, and, I, and I, under, I also understand the idea that if this didn't happen to him, Lord help us, right? If this is a made up accusation and it destroys, this could destroy him completely. It could destroy his marriage could destroy his current judgeship. So don't think I haven't thought about both of those things. But at the end of the day, if we just chalk it up to boys being boys, then we actually don't stop this cycle. And, 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 and that, that's a part of this. So you're asking, I'm trying to understand it better from a woman's perspective, because I think, I, obviously, I've spent 46, 45 and a half years understanding it from a male perspective. So I would just quickly say, so I covered the Clarence Thomas hearings and the Anita Hill. And the difference is just what happened in this room that just was something now. else, I know. Okay? So the awareness, the Me Too movement, the grassroots nature, because when Anita Hill was testifying, she had the weight of women on her shoulders. And, and yeah. right? <laughs> right? Yeah. Yep. And, and there is a, it's a very different environment now. And you're, the burden of proof remains a very tricky thing in this, in this particular but we case. should always but point out, is, by the way, and I pointed this out multiple times yesterday, that the least reported uh, crime in this country is sexual assault. And we, do, and, and, and we always need to remind people so, that that is true. Which is, which is why this, these next few days are going to be so mm -hmm. amazing, difficult, and fraught. All right, next. Hi. And we've, o we've only got about six minutes left here, so if you ask fast and you answer fast... <laughs> it's on me. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Well, hello. Thank you so much for having this conversation with all of us. My name is Natalie, and I'm a sophomore in the Columbian College. I was wondering, do you believe that this political climate has done irreparable damage to the relationship between the press, the public, and the presidency? Uh, no. Um, I think we would. I think that. I think the, the 50s would have said that. Um, the press started this a war at the turn of the century. I mean, it's been worse. Um, so, no, I think that, that it, it, it's, in some ways, the press is, has never been more relevant. So, in that sense, it's, it's never been, it's never been a, had the potential to be as strong of an institution in this country um, as it is right now. So, I, I, I'm, in that sense, I'm very optimistic. Go ahead. Uh, hi, Professor. I'm, uh, I'm James. I'm a junior studying computer science and political science. Uh, my question is, uh, what is a uh, journalist's responsibility to tell what is a truth, or I'm sorry, what is a, a lie from what is a falsehood or an alternative fact? <laughs> All right. This is the lie question. Uh, I, get, I, get, I get this question quite a bit. I, you know, do you, when, do you, when do you ever accuse somebody of being a lie? When you know the motive, when you know they're doing it. On purpose. On purpose. Right? And the problem is, 
tough thing to claim as a journalist, that you know for sure that somebody's giving you this, you know, is, is, is definitely lying to you, that they're not giving you another version of a story or this is how they're, you know, I think, I, I think that, that it's a high bar. The word, you know, when you decide to, that you're labeling, you know, I, I guess the, what is it, the Washington Post has come up with, they say the fact, the Glenn Kessler, right, the fact checker, he said if, if Trump keeps using something, a stat that he has fact checked multiple times and has gotten a response from the White House about it, then he'll start saying, well, now the president's lying about it because he knows that that fact isn't true. But I do think that, that we serve our, that we have an opportunity to convince more readers of the truth if we at least show that we are, we are not going to motive immediately. You know, that we're keeping, keeping an open mind of, okay, they have an alternative explanation here. We'll let, and then over time, we'll see if, if, if the facts bear out. I am very sorry, but our clock is closing in. You get to the last question here. Actually, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna do your last question. I'm gonna do the woman behind you because this has been very male dominated this evening. <laughs> and I'm gonna make sure we have a little time. Well, thank you, Mr. Sesno. Thank you, Mr. Todd, for coming. My name is Garrett Hoff. I'm a freshman political communication major here at SNPA. And my question is, you talked a lot about the ideas of conservatives need to come up and hold conservative media accountable. How are you going to reach out to conservatives to actually put that in action if a lot of conservatives don't necessarily believe you at this point in time? I, it, you know, I look at what, uh, I mean, I mean, I, I, we, I have a lot of conservatives on my show. Um, we, we always make a, a, an extra effort of that. We've been hiring more and more conservative commentators um, because, as I say, I want to be prepared for the post-Trump era, right? Sort of, there is sort of a different, I think, look, the Trump era is this entertainment meets the press. It's sort of taking the WWE, you know, <laughs> reality television. And so it's going to be, you know, but in the post-Trump era, I think we'll be in a different mindset. Look, I think, I actually think if you look at what the Weekly Standard and, and National Review are doing, they're trying to actually hold the, the, the hold this populist movement accountable. Look, the other thing is, is correctly identifying what's conservative. I mean, the Trump movement is ne isn't necessarily small government conservative. It's not free markets, right? He, and so that's what's very disconcerting for, you know, I, I, I I grew up in a split household. My dad was a very much a small C conservative, um, meaning small government, very much a free market person. Um, you know, the Republican Party is split in two. I mean, Donald Trump doesn't believe in small government. He believes in strong government. Right? It's a much different um, ideology. I think we need to do a better job of describing his ideology. Now, I know most people want to say there's no ideology there. No, not, not necessarily with him, but, there's, but people are forming one for him. They're sort of taking his instincts and turning it into sort of, and there is something there, what, what a nationalist you know, foreign policy looks like, what a nationalist economic policy looks like. But it's not conservative, right? Or in the, in this, in the tradition, in the, in the William F. Buckley sense of the word. Um, so I think that one of the things we could do better is is, and that makes my, I always say putting my panel together is a three dimension, 3D puzzle, because you know, there's, your, there's your Trump wing of the party that's different from the conservative wing of the party. So one of the criticisms I get a lot, oh no, 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 you have a bunch of people that don't like Trump. They may be more conservative than Trump, but then they say, oh, you're, 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 not, you're not fair. You know, so it, in that sense, fairness is in the eye of the, eye of the beholder on that front. Our last question. Yep. Hi. So you touched a little bit on where you think the news and covering of the news goes after the Trump administration, but how do you think we take it back to facts? Like, do you think there is a future after the Trump administration where we go back to the fact that it's no longer accept acceptable to have alternative facts? No, I, I think this is going to be. I think rooting this out of the our politics is going to take a while. I think people are you know, um, <clears throat> politics is just like. If you follow, if you ever follow football very closely, um, you know the minute somebody finds success with a new offensive scheme, there's like seven thousand teams that copy it. You know the spread offense literally spread like a virus uh, around football, high school up to college, college now up to pro, et cetera. Um, and so, in some sense, you have a lot of people that are seeing what Trump got away with and thinking, you know, 
they're going to run this way and they're going to do it. So I think it's, and, and there is this sense of you can just deny, deny, deny. Um, look, I do think that the country sort of is going to recalibrate itself, right? We, we do. We sort of, we, we, you know, again, I do believe in the voters knew what they were doing. And I, and I, I, I think there's a, every chance we will look back at the 2016 election and say, um, it was, it was the election that was necessary to rebuild a lot of institutions that needed rebuilding in this country. And you can say it was a great four or eight years or a disastrous four or eight years, but it's gonna be a consequential four or eight years. And it's going to force us to rethink what these institutions should be, how we, you know, and I think, I look at it, you look at, you, you look at people in, in different walks of life have, have decided that they're, they realize that their, their actions speak for more than just themselves. You know, I noticed that and, and I feel like we in the press, we're, we're still competitive, but we're realizing, hey, we have a, we have a role in this democracy that, that is important still, let's not forget it. So I think that in that sense that, that there's this renewal and that's why I will never accept this idea that, that the Trump election was a, was a you know, I'm, it, it, We'll let historians decide in 50 years, but I, I think this has been, this should, we hopefully will look at this as a, as a healthy exercise that the country desperately needed. And sometimes you have to do something extreme in order to get everybody to listen. Thank you. I always close with something that, where I turn to the students in the audience to ask you something and then ask our guests to respond. How many students here tonight are thinking or are considering going into public service in one form or another, working in government, working abroad, working in the media? Look at that's those great. hands. So that's a GW audience. Yeah. Chuck, what do you, we are living in an extraordinarily fraught time mm -hmm. um, when many people in, in, in public life have, are finding it difficult to be in public life where we've got this very adversarial relationship all around us, where some people, frankly, are throwing in the towel and leaving government or public service or trying to do it in a different way yeah. um, through some other form of, of, of public service. You've interviewed so many people. You have your own trajectory out of, out of GW that's gotten you right. to where you are. What do you say to this room full of folks today who are looking at the future, because that's what it's all about, and thinking about where they fit in and how they get there. First of all, uh, this is why I came here. So you guys, I came here because I wanted to work in Washington. I didn't know what I wanted to do, but I, I wanted to be here. I wanted to be in the seat of government. Um, I wanted, to, I wanted to, to contribute in, in some way. I thought I wanted to work in government, uh, work in campaigns. Um, I got a quick early experience, didn't like it as much, and I got hooked on the, hooked on the, um, on the political camp being able to be a political campaign handicapper guy. I used to say, I, I didn't even call myself a journalist until about the year 2000. Um, I'd done, been doing about eight years and I'm, I used to think of myself more as just an analyst. Um, we were just aggregators. Well, now that's journalism. Um, <laughs> but that's a long story. Um, what I would say is I, I've actually been, and I, and I, and, and I go back to, the, to what I think has been interesting the result of the Trump election is that I think people are taking their citizenship a little more seriously. And that, 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 that group of hand raising there tells me a lot, right? There's a lot of people that care about the direction of this country, care about the direction of our democracy, care about the direction of, of where we're headed as this global community, right? And I think that, that we realize that this, we're sort of in this, we know this is a pivot moment. Um, so, this sort of makes me a little more optimistic, you know, because you're here. I've noticed more people as demoralized as some people that have been in this business a long time have been. Um, the amount of enthusiasm that I've seen on the campaign trail, that I've seen on college campuses, that I've seen in high schools, um, that I've noticed just with my own daughter and the amount of paying attention is that, is that suddenly people are taking their citizenship a little more seriously. You know, one of the most, one of the more amazing things to experience when you visit Israel 
is that aspect of Israel, is how, how being a citizen, you feel like you're on the front lines, right? You're, this own, you're, this, you're, this, you're the only democracy in this region with a whole bunch of people that you feel like are always, and yet there's, and there's this sense that, that people move to Israel and want to be citizens there to, to show that democracy can thrive there. And Look, I don't want to get into the politics of, 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 of the Israeli government. I want to separate that out from what I'm describing here. But I remember when I was over there, and this was about 15 years ago, the first time I went, and the subsequent times that I've been since, you get this sense from Israelis that it's just that, that they have to pay attention to what's going on all the time. Now, the, Andrew Sullivan wrote something right after the Trump election. He said, you know, true freedom is the freedom of not having to think about politics and not having to think about your citizenship. And there's something to that. But there's also something that's very healthy that if we do remember that, hey, our citizenship is important, civics, your civic life is important, participate in it in some way. You don't have to run. You don't have to, you don't have to be an activist, but you, sh you should vote. You should pay more attention. And I, and I think that in that sense, you've seen a renewed sense of, I've got to participate. Whatever participate means to you, I got to do something more. So that's where I see some optimism. I would, I would share that. And I would tell you that I, I felt, there are a number of first year students in this room, and I felt a, a passion this year, mm -hmm. and among all our students, that um, says that we need to be involved. Whatever side of this debate we're on, whatever position we take, and that's why people are in this room. A few thank yous, right? Thank you, President LeBlanc, for sharing so much of your Sorry. time here this evening and for leading this institution and for what you are trying to build here. If you don't know, and I will share this with you, President LeBlanc talks a lot about the student experience on this campus. And this is part, I hope, of what you have in mind. But this, you know, your ideas are most welcome. I want to thank next the faculty of the School of Media and Public Affairs, many who joined us tonight. Raise your hand. OK, thank you for work. And I finally want to thank uh, Jen Halpin and John Perino on our great staff for helping put this event together. We couldn't do it without you. Thank you very much. And join me, please, in thanking a fellow GW traveler <laughs> who has taken this journey and taken it to such a level of influence and a voice. Chuck Todd, thank you so much for being here. Good night, everybody. Please be safe. Thank you.